Hello, this is Jim Salas. You are listening to a re-recording of my presentation in the America Walks webinar on May 13th. I'm re-recording this because the original had some problems with the audio. So I'm gonna talk about physical activity and COVID-19. Here's the outline, the main message. Physical activity is a powerful health enhancer that may help with the coronavirus pandemic in six ways that I will outline. Um, and from this, we will include, uh, conclude that walking is a very relevant activity during the pandemic and more physical activity should be a priority during the pandemic, not an afterthought. Um, many are questioning the wisdom of walkability in the pandemic, especially related to density. So I'm going to give you at least one answer to what is the connection between density and COVID-19? And does walkability hurt or help during the pandemic? And I'm gonna give you a preview of the recommendations at the end. This is an opportunity for us to advocate for walking and walkability even more forcefully. And promoting equitable solutions is more important than ever. So this is just a reminder that physical uh, activity is one of the most powerful forces for health. And these data from the World Health Organization show that physical inactivity is the fourth leading cause of death worldwide. And this is a uh, affects people in countries of all income levels. And there are many, many uh, reasons um, why physical activity is good for you and uh, it does many different things. But even with this whole list um, of benefits across the age range, uh, there's no mention of improves infectious diseases. And that's what I'm going to emphasize now. Um, and a little bit of the, the physiology here, when the, uh, uh, the coronavirus that we're dealing with right now um, gets inside of you, it attaches to, it gets into your trachea and your lungs, um, and it uh, attacks the lining of those uh, parts of your body and takes over cells and starts replicating and uh, uh, creates a, a, a widespread infection. So when uh, your immune system is always looking for invaders like this virus, and so it will uh, find them and attack them. But um, sometimes that attack uh, creates inflammation, serious inflammation, which um, causes the lining of your lungs to get thicker and um, less effective at exchanging gases, which is why um, COVID-19 um, can make people have a very hard time breathing. So that means the key physiological processes here deal with your immune system and inflammation. And so here are six ways that physical activity can help with controlling the pandemic. The first one is that moderate intensity activity, like walking, um, enhances immune function and reduces inflammation. So it could reduce the severity of uh, COVID-19 infections as it does with other respiratory infections, but we don't have direct evidence about COVID-19. So um, uh, interestingly, extended vigorous activity like marathons seems to reduce immune function. Um, so walking is an ideal and accessible and free activity for most people. Second benefit, moderate physical activity can improve the common chronic conditions that increase risk for severe COVID-19. And uh, those conditions include obesity and diabetes and heart disease and, uh, and cancer. And so about 95% of all COVID-19 deaths are in people with these chronic conditions that moderate physical activity helps with uh, year in, year out. Third benefit, moderate physical activity is one of the best stress management methods. And that obviously is important because basically the whole world is under stressful conditions right now because of the health 
and um, economic and social isolation um, stressors of the pandemic. Fourth benefit, stress and distress create imbalances in the hormone cortisol that negatively affect, again, both immune function and inflammation. But moderate physical activity is one of the best ways to reduce that stress and bring cortisol into balance. So yet another way of improving immunity and inflammation. Fifth benefit, moderate physical activity produces antioxidants that reduce the severity of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a serious and relatively common complication of COVID-19. So not surprisingly, being active helps your lungs. Sixth benefit, both acute, meaning every time you're active, and chronic activity over time, uh, improve your immune response to vaccines. So hopefully this will be relevant in the relatively near future. And this, the need to improve immune response is especially important for older adults whose immune systems are less efficient. But there are several studies like this one. Um, older adults assigned to aerobic exercise were 30 to 100% more likely than a uh, low activity control group to attain sufficient antibodies from flu vaccine. And so the flu virus uh, is a type of coronavirus. So there, there very well could be uh, benefits of being active um, in helping people um, respond uh, adequately to the um, whatever upcoming vaccines we have for, for this virus. So six ways that physical activity helps with the, the pandemic. Um, so that deals with walking. What about walkability? How relevant is walkability for COVID-19? So I want to um, give a couple of highlights from a commentary that a colleague and I wrote called Strengths and Weaknesses of Activity-Friendly Neighborhoods During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, the lead author is Deepti Ablaka. Um, she is uh, at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and uh, has a background in city planning and public health. And so we've submitted our commentary to the journal called Cities and Health for a special issue and Hopefully that will be accepted and available soon. But here are a couple of highlights. So uh, we are, we, uh, you may have seen that people are saying dense cities are bad uh, because they um, lead to more infections. Um, and so we set out to look at that. So we found public data on how dense cities are around the world and found some uh, at a wide range of density. And we uh, looked up uh, current death rates. And so what you see here is density by death rate um, per 100,000 people in those cities. And so at the, the left-hand side, you will, there will be cities like Phoenix and Dallas. And at the right hand, the most dense place we found was Manila in the Philippines. And if you look overall, there's really no relationship between uh, density and uh, death rates uh, from COVID-19. And, but you certainly see some outliers, New York City way up at the top and a, a couple of cities in, in France. But uh, while we think of New York City as extremely dense in the US, uh, on a worldwide scale, it's kind of in the middle. Um, so, uh, and why don't we see um, a, a relation between density and uh, COVID-19. And it's because a lot of the cities, especially uh, the high uh, density cities in Asia, um, they knew what to do at the beginning of this pandemic and immediately uh, uh, shut down, started testing and tracing contacts. And, um, and you can see they, so far they've been doing this pretty effectively. And these death rates are from early May, 2020. Um, so there's, uh, I think, some uh, pretty uh, useful information. And then at the end of the, uh, our commentary, we summarize 
um, our analysis of how in, uh, environmental attributes may be related to both chronic diseases, that's what NCDs are, non-communicable diseases, as well as ID, infectious diseases. So um, most of these environmental attributes um, we've been studying for quite a while in re uh, and their uh, components of walkable or activity-friendly neighborhoods. And so we know that they are uh, related to more physical activity and lower risk of chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, that sort of thing. Uh, the one negative, so a plus is a favorable uh, uh, documented or expected effect. Uh, uh, minus is a negative effect. And you see that's only with automobile optimized transportation systems. So we know that car oriented cities are, is the opposite of a walkable, a walkable city. So um, more interesting to look at um, the expected effects on infectious diseases. So for residential density, I already showed you the lack of relationship. It's a, it's a zero as far as we can tell. Um, mixed land use should be a net positive um, because people can walk and bike um, for a transportation to go where they need to go. Um, they don't uh, need to, uh, if it's really mixed, they can walk and they, they don't need to use uh, public transportation so much. Um, being in your car is probably better for infectious diseases because uh, it, certainly in the US, almost all trips are one person, so you're not exposed to someone else. Um, um, so, but I heard, a, and the other thing is, I heard a Ford Motor uh, Company executive say that uh, in your car, you can control your environment. So I expect we're gonna hear that as a, uh, as a on an advertising pretty soon. Um, the biggest concern uh, from our point of view is public transportation uh, because people are uh, crowded together in, uh, uh, typically in buses and trains, um, but there are mitigation strategies that can be done that are being done now, limiting the people that can get on, um, keeping them separated from each other and from the driver, uh, sanitizing uh, frequently, and um, uh, wearing masks. So, uh, but that's, that's something we uh, are going to have to keep our eye on and work on, make sure public transportation is not further de-invested. Bicycle and pedestrian facilities, parks, trails, and open space, all of these are places where uh, people can walk and bike while keeping uh, good distance. Um, one exception might be uh, in the U.S., most sidewalks are too narrow to allow people to pass at a safe distance. So uh, this, this pandemic could be an opportunity um, to widen sidewalks uh, for health purposes. Um, so uh, all of uh, places to be active outdoors are particularly good because the risk of getting infected outdoors is less, but still people should, uh, should wear masks. And then we're seeing open streets programs uh, proliferating um, to, as a way of providing more space for activity so that people uh, can be at safer distances. So, we, uh, so most of the things that we've been working on to promote walking and walkability really have positive effects on infectious diseases, as far as we can tell. So in summary, walkability generally benefits chronic and infectious diseases. Concerns about risk of infectious disease contagion in urban areas are leading to recommendations to reduce density and reliance on public transport. That's a problem. Urban design recommendations need to be made considering the effects on both infectious diseases and chronic diseases. Um, NCDs currently account for about 65% of global deaths and about 80% of deaths in, a, in the US. So, uh, um, and the, the rest of the, the 20% is not all infectious diseases. It includes violence and uh, traffic crashes and um, uh, infant deaths and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, if we do things um, that might reduce the risk of infectious diseases, but increase the risk of chronic diseases, that would be a net negative. Um, if permanent 
urban design decisions are made solely on the basis of infectious disease risk that could be severe unintended though predictable health consequences for chronic diseases. And finally, my conclusions and requests. Physical activity should be widely recommended and promoted during the pandemic. It's, it's uh, been typically uh, considered to be an essential activity, uh, so people can go outside and do it. That's good, but that's not the same as specifically educating people about the benefits of physical activity for infectious disease and explicitly promoting it. Walkability is expected to have mostly favorable effects on both infectious and chronic diseases. And the pandemic is impacting older adults, people of color, and lower income communities particularly hard. So we need to work um, uh, particularly uh, hard again to um, uh, make sure that our interventions to get people active are, are benefiting these uh, disadvantaged or at-risk groups first. Um, so uh, putting, uh, uh, putting uh, open streets in their in, uh, neighborhoods uh, of uh, people with people of concern uh, most uh, first. Okay, so and my requests to you are to um, oppose recommendations to reduce density and transit service um, uh, if the rationale is to reduce contagion. Uh, we need to be smarter than that. So we advocates need to be even bolder in our advocacy for walking, walkability, and equity. So I thank you for your attention and seeking out this uh, um, seeking out this uh, re-recorded uh, webinar talk. So best wishes, wishes to you.